Welcome to the Ancient Christian Writer Series, led by Father David Abernethy at the Oratory of St. Philip Neri in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The following recording is a reading and discussion of the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. Our ability to provide podcasts free of charge is made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. If you would like to make a contribution in support of our ministries, please visit www thepittsburgoratory.org. Your interest and prayerful support are appreciated. God bless you and enjoy the podcast. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Okay, welcome back to the Ancient Christian Writers series and to our discussion of St. Isaac the Syrian's ascetical homilies. And we're currently uh, uh, picking up with homily number three on page 127 of the text. And we're going to start one paragraph with one paragraph we read last time just so that we have a bit of a context uh, for what we'll be looking at here this evening. Uh, we're going to be looking in particular at the, the nature of the soul itself, uh, what passions are, and whether passions are something that are, are part of the soul, or if the soul is by nature dispassionate, as it is in the image of God. And so it, it's going to be a little bit laborious for us, but I think long term it is going to pay off for us in terms of our understanding of the human person, how the passions act upon us, and how they affect the soul. And so having some clarity about this is going to aid us in reading not only St. Isaac, but other fathers of the church, but also, I think, understanding who we are as human beings and how we struggle with the passions more directly. And so, as I said again, we're picking up with the second paragraph on page 127. When the senses, however, are confined by stillness and not permitted to venture forth, and by its aid the soul's memories grow old, then you will see what are the soul's natural thoughts, that is, the nature of the soul, and what treasures she has hidden within herself. These treasures are the perception of things incorporeal, which of itself is inspired in the soul, without the exercise of forethought and toil for its sake. For a man does not even know that such thoughts could arise in human nature, for who taught him these things, or how did he comprehend that which, even when understood, is impossible to make plain to others? Or who was his guide to that which he has never learned from another? And so, He'll go into greater detail here about what would be sort of the natural aspects of the soul. And this would be able to, uh, its ability to look at things within nature, understand their, their qualities, what they mean, and also to be able to understand what's going on within one's own heart and to see uh, truths about other human beings. You know, able to grasp reality in a certain way. And so that would be the more natural ability of the soul. The supernatural ability of the soul would be able to comprehend the very things of God uh, and to uh, be able to perceive and, and understand them, not necessarily to be able to articulate them clearly, but to be able to Uh, perceive them through that purity of heart that we've spoken of so often in the past. And so this is what Isaac is setting us up to understand now. He's telling us there are things that when the uh, soul is no longer affected by the passions, when it's been quieted by living a life of stillness, when the memories, the imagination have all faded uh, from the effects of the passions, then it begins to be able to see things that it never knew it could see or understand. And so this is what he's, he's beginning to lead us to here. And so that's where we left off last time, and we'll 
pick up here with the next paragraph. Such, then, is the nature of the soul. The passions are consequently an addition to nature from causes in the soul. Yet by nature, the soul is passionless. Whenever you hear in the scriptures of passions of the soul and body, know that this is said in reference to the causes of the passions. For the soul is naturally dispassionate. Those who prefer outward philosophy do not accept this, and neither do they ad their adherents. But we believe that God created his image passionless. Yet I do not mean his image in reference to the body, but to the soul, which is invisible. For every image is taken from a prototype, and it is impossible for a visible image to depict the likeness of something invisible. So you must believe that the passions, as we said earlier, do not belong to the soul by nature. But if anyone wishes to challenge what has been said, we shall ask. And then he goes on to offer a kind of question and answer uh, series of, of things. But So the idea here is that the soul can be affected by the passions, that they stir our nature, our human nature, our, through the senses. And whenever this is distorted or disordered because of our sin, that this has an effect upon the soul because of the unique uh, tie between the two within us. And, uh, but when the passions have been pure, purified or quieted, then also then there would be a positive effect upon the soul. They wouldn't be affecting it in a negative kind of way. But the, the passions themselves are something that are rooted in the body and they are, are activated in and through our senses, our perception of the things around us. And our sin leads us then to become focused upon them and our, our will becomes affected by them to the point that we are guided in our actions and our decisions by them. So the soul would be affected in a negative way. We would not be choosing the will of God, but choosing our, to satisfy our own will because the soul has been affected by the, the arousal of, of the passions through our bodily senses. But so Isaac is making the argument here, which he says some might disagree with, that the, the, the soul is not by nature the place of the origin of the passions, that because God is, made, God is dispassionate, and that the soul is not something that is visible, that it is not going to be the, a place of origin of the passion. Certainly it can be affected by them, but it it's, would be wrong to say that we have been created, uh, that the soul has been created uh, passionate, mm -hmm. that it's dispassionate in the sense that it isn't driven by the... Uh, of its very nature, it isn't driven by the senses and, and the way that we often experience ourselves. And it is confusing because sometimes the language that we use will tie or speak of the soul and the body as being uh, driven by the, the passions. And so he's trying to make give us some clarity here so that as we make our way along in discussion, discussing the passions more fully and the effects that they have on us, we aren't getting confused. And I see you already are because you're giving me the, the I won't say the evil eye, but the stink eye is I what I was what looking for. You were, you were thinking about that. So what's your? Oh, I wanna, well, a couple of things. Mm. One is I wonder what, well, just get, if he is equating uh, passions or proneness to vice with the body or rooting it rooting the origin in the body, then what would he do with the fallen angels? Because they don't have bodies, and yet they have been driven by passion, one could say. Or would we say that that, you know, the, the fall was rooted even in a dispassionate kind of choice? That they could see all the fruits of their choice 
And so the fall is complete and absolute because it allows no room for repentance. Whereas the fact that we know this kind of disorder that darkens the, the intellect and weakens the will, the repentance becomes a possibility for us. But since they are bodiless, that they see all ramifications of those choices, but it's not as though that they are driven to it, you know, in this kind of blinded way that we are often driven to our sins mm -hmm. because we are blinded by the passions. So do you think he would say that the angels, the fallen, or the angels, an angelic creature is passionless? Right, I whether, think so. Whether fallen or not. Right, yeah. Yeah, because they don't, they don't share in our corporeal nature. Yeah, and then I just wonder how this measures up with how St. Thomas or the church would... I don't know. Don't that. ask me. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I can go there. If anybody else wants to cover that, you're, you're more than welcome. But uh, we'll try just to stick to the What's Syriac <laughs> fathers here and not get into Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> so when he's saying soul, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, is he sort of... the word when something is is he kind of uh isolating soul and body so that he can examine them or is he when he says soul does he mean man like is is he basically using soul as what makes a man essentially man and then the body is more like uh an you know a I think, shell i think he's separating them solely for the sake of being able to make these distinctions realizing okay. that they're within us intimately mm -hmm. tied together and cannot be separated okay and and he does this to show that the the soul can become ill by the effects of the passions that are rooted in our bodiliness okay. because you know it's in and through our bodiliness that we can commune with everything within creation itself and it's in and through our senses that we enter into that communion and because of our sin then that that communion becomes something that's distorted and then we become driven not by the, the higher aspects of who and what we are as human beings but driven by these lower and baser elements of who we are and so I think he would even say you know separating the two is a dangerous thing to do because then you distort our understanding of who, who we are as human beings. But for the sake of discussion mm -hmm. and for clarity's sake, we need to do it at least to this extent while then moving back to show how. So he's really talking about souls like a principle, and the body is part of that kind of hypostatic union that makes a man, yeah. but fallen, it can poison the soul. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the union between the two is, you know, undeniable, I think, in his eyes. And he even says, you know, there, it's often said that the passions are within the soul and the body. It's, it's because, and he's saying, you know, we use language that way because we see the connection between body and soul as being so complete and radical. But for the sake of this clarity, we need to speak of the nature of the two in order to understand where the passions have their roots so that we can begin to struggle with them. And because they do make the soul ill, they do make us ill in the sense of the effect that they have upon us and the, how they make us unable then to, to, to live a, a godly life. You know, they destroy the image of God within us. Let's just let him take us where he's going to go. It's too early to ask too many questions. I'm going to freak <laughs> okay. out now. Well, um, I was freaking out reading this over and over again, trying to understand it, so share my pain. Uh, okay, we're about halfway down the page on 128 for those who came in a little bit late, where it says, question. What is the nature of the soul? Is it then something passionless, and filled with light, 
or something passionate and dark. If the nature of the soul was once translucent and pure by the reception of that blessed light, it will be found the same when it returns to its original state. Therefore, when the soul is moved in a passionate way, she is confessedly outside her nature as the children of the church maintain. The passions, therefore, enter into the soul afterwards, and it is not right to say that the passions belong to the soul even though she is moved by them. Hence, it is evident that she is moved by things from without, not by what is her own. If passions are said to be natural, because by them the soul is moved through the intermediary of the body, then hunger, thirst, and sleep would be also be natural to the soul, because she suffers in these things and groans together with the body, in the amputation of its members and fevers and diseases and so forth. For because of her communion with the body, the soul suffers pain together with it, just as the body with the soul, and the soul is moved to gladness by the body's gladness, and she bears its afflictions. So he is here expressing, you know, there is this radical union between the two, but where we place the origin of the passions becomes very important in our understanding of how to combat them that the origin isn't in this aspect of ourselves that has been created in the image of God and is enduring, that, you know, it is rooted in, and we experience it, rooted in, you know, things like sickness, hunger, thirst, sleep. You know, that's where all our passions arise when we allow these things to become disordered in some way, or oversleep, fall into sloth, hunger, fall into gluttony. You know, same with thirst, you know, kind of gluttony or drunkenness. Okay, so I know it's a bit confusing, but I think in the long run it's going to serve us well, so just bear with me here a little bit. I did read it over a hundred times trying to figure out what he was saying here, so I'm not sure if I still got it right, but... Another question he puts forward then to us, what is the na natural state of the soul? And what is the state contrary to nature? And what is the state above nature? And this is an important paragraph, I think, for us, it, where he makes an important distinction. The, the natural state of the soul is understanding of God's creatures, both sensory and noetic. So, you know, with the eye of the heart purified in some sense, when we are free of our passions, we can uh, understand uh, ourselves as human beings, and we can also understand others, you know, what's going on in their life. We have this ability to perceive whatever it is they're, they're struggling with, or simply be able to perceive their identity. And when, on a noetic level, when the eye of the heart has been purified, we can see even more deeply. And this is why you would see, like, within these elders of the church, these holy souls, the ability to read souls, to read what's go you know, going on within the life of the person that they're talking to. Because noetically, their heart has been purified, so their vision has been purified. And they have this ability to grasp what we typically would seek to hide from ourselves and from others. And so you hear these stories of saints being able to read souls or tell confessors being able to tell people their sins even before they articulate them. Or, you know, I think it was Philip Neary who could smell when a person was in a, a state of, of sin or when they had fallen into lustfulness, you know, that he there was something of an, of an odor not of sanctity that he would pick up, but just the the opposite. St. Catherine of Siena had the same gift. Yeah. People that are not easy to be around. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to smell people's sins. So this is just the natural state of the soul that he's talking about and its ability to perceive things. The supernatural state of the soul is her movement in the divine vision of the supersubstantial deity. The connatural state of the soul is her being moved 
by the passions. So, uh, you know, the supernatural state then is our ability to enter into this union communion with God, to know God, to perceive God, and to, to grasp something of God's nature, not perhaps being able to articulate that, but seeing it, perceiving it uh, through the purified heart and through the, the gaze of faith. And then the co-natural state would be when the, the soul is affected then by the passions, is what he's that saying here. This is contranatural. Contranatural, that's right. Again, I'm sorry, that's right. Against nature, it, the nature of the soul is that her being is moved by the passions. So when the soul is not functioning in the way that it should be, it's not perceiving the truth of others or of God, but it's being affected by the passions the lower level of who we are as human beings, our baser desires. Uh, and, and this is exactly what the divine and great Basil has said. When the soul is found in accord with her nature, her life is on high. When she is found outside her nature, she is below upon the earth. When she is on high, she is free from the passions but as soon as her nature descends from its own state, the passions are found in her. So, you know, it would be appropriate to say that the, the kingdom of God is within. You know, when we have been purified from the passions, we experience this communion with God, this ability to enter into communion and to perceive the truth of God. But the moment that we, our gaze is turned away from God and towards what is below or against the natural state of the soul is when that vision becomes clouded for us. And so you can be, understand why silence and solitude would be so important in the eyes of St. Isaac, that we remove those things that could affect or give rise to the passions in our life. We control our appetites, but we even control what's coming in through our other uh, means of perception. So we avoid distractions, we engage in silence and solitude, and so do not inflame the passions in any way and are able to live in the soul's natural state. And often, again, that's not a choice that we make as human beings. In fact, we're taught to choose just the opposite to inflame the passions and to flee solitude and silence. Where, you know, again, this, this image of God being able to utter a word equal to himself, that we flee that state of silence, of solitude, where we can hear God and listen to God, and we distract ourselves with things that are not God. So even if they aren't sinful, uh, in their very nature, they can still distract us from th this intimacy, intimacy with God that we are seeking. And we, before the group started, we were talking a little bit about evangelization and how that takes place in our day and how perhaps it was easier to convert pagans of old than it would be to engage people in our own culture because then there was still this pursuit of the truth and openness to the truth, a desire for a kind of virtue. But now we've fallen into a kind of relativism and nihilism. You know, how is it that you engage and evangelize men and women of a culture such as this? And it seems to me that the most powerful way to do it is to live what St. Isaac is saying here, to become a living witness to this reality that we are called to as men and women, to live in this passionless state of union and communion with God. And to, so to reveal a way that is distinctive and powerful and beautiful, that this is what is going to be most uh, attractive and you know, break through you know, that thick shell now that even philosophically could not we couldn't engage. Like, how do you engage nihilist? You know, what kind of conversation do you have with them? I think it becomes very difficult. 
Uh, whereas a life that is lived in a godly fashion bears more direct witness than our words ever could. You know, uh, a holy soul is going to bear witness to the power of God's grace uh, more powerfully than, than anything else. And so what we need is those who you know, make, you know, seek to be saints. Yes, Father. Well, I was just reminded of an icon of Saint Seraphim of Sarov. Very often the scroll says, acquire the Holy Spirit and thousands around you will be saved. Right. And it's right. still in the tradition. Right. Or that, okay, okay, yeah, right. Or that one individual within a family who knows the peace of the kingdom or who prays can affect the entire family, but it will raise, raise it up. And so that would be true of a culture. Even a small group of individuals living this fully could set aflame the, the larger culture. That's why, you know, St. Philip Neri could say, give me ten truly detached men and I could, could convert the world. And unless we are just going to dismiss that as a pious sentiment, you know, we have to say, well, what was he talking about there? Was he saying that those who were really living this life fully are going to be the, such powerful witnesses that they could inflame the culture? Yes. Oh, great. Well, Father, since... As, you know, as we apply this to the people in this room, and since we're not monks or hermits, we have to <clears throat> excuse me, go to class every day or go to work or you know, concentrate on all the daily things that we have to do. Would you suggest then it's just a matter of degree, and if we can just try to cut out certain passions each day and, and, and replace that with whatever like this, or, or reading the, the scriptures, or reading some other uh, religious things, and just do it on an incremental basis, that we're going to be better off than we were before we even attempted it? I mean, is that, would you say that's the whole idea, since we can't give up our worldly, secular lives, necessarily? We can't? Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Depends let's say you're a work for eight hours. Secular. Right. It's about, okay, it depends what you mean, mean by worldly and secular, but uh, I've just started reading this book called Desert Living. And he's ta he's, it's a, a priest who's talking exactly what we so often talk about here, about bringing what the Desert Fathers wrote about and lived to the city and embracing this life in such a way that it is transformative both for our lives and for those around us and are we called to something less lesser than monks or you know religious or priest or are we called to that same level of sanctity and what would that mean for us living in the world in a city and you know uh, does that mean that we you know, embrace a radical kind of simplicity of life that, again, and this is the point that he argues, that this is a vocation within a vocation and that our lives have to become distinctive. You know, for us as Christians, we're living in exactly the same way that everyone else around us is living. Go to the same movies, watch the same things on TV, eat the same kind of food, dress the same kind of way, pursue our careers in the same kind of way. Absolutely nothing distinctive uh, about that. And he's saying that it can't be that way for us. You know, that there has to be a distinctive element to how we are living, which is the pursuit of the holiness, overcoming the passions, pursuing the virtues, living in greater simplicity, solitude, silence, and changing our lives, that it becomes reflective of that reality. And if we should not be surprised when people come in to our churches and they see nothing there that stirs their heart because there is nothing there that is reflective of the reality that's been made possible for us through the gift of the Spirit and through the gift of the sacraments. 
that we are not living our lives in such a way that shows that we grasp who and what it is that we've become by the grace of God. So you know, there should be a distinctive way that we are living. And to, in my mind, you know, how do we do this in uh, a minimalist kind of way? Because the culture is always going to be stronger more money there and the influence of the culture around us, you know, university culture. If you think about it, you know, they're constantly bombarded in their classes by fellow students, through the media, television, by things that are absolutely contrary to the gospel. And so how do you how do you participate in that a little bit? You know, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and say, you know, for a Christian entering into that world, you know, life is going to be difficult and you're going to be mocked, you're going to be criticized, and you're going to be rejected in the same way that Jesus said that you would would be. And I think we're sort of deluded when we think that we can participate in it and have that, and, and as Christian men and women, and not experience that in our lives. And nobody's, I don't think anybody's asking that question. You know, there's talk about evangelization and, and uh, you know, and even sort of participating in the world around us and, you know, sort of lifting it up, shaping, you know, shaping it by our, by the gospel and you know what more often hap happens to us is that we're shaped by the culture into the point that, of insignificance well then my mind keeps going to little children and how the world wants us to expose them to everything so that they know what everything's about and but I, I think sheltering is mm -hmm. better in the long run I mean I know we know I know a Catholic Lake community, they're probably 30 or 40, 40 kids, and they are sharp as tacks. They don't watch TV, they don't see movies, they don't have phones. They're, they're, learning to, they're training horses, and they're learning how to raise chickens, and, but, but they study, and they're really, I mean, they don't, aren't exposed to what the world wants to give, but they don't, they don't need it. They don't miss it. I mean, they probably would love to have these things, but their parents don't allow it, and they're happy right. and healthy. Right. So, and they're formed from the earliest moments of their lives. I think John Chrysostom said that you know the most important thing to do for your children is to educate them in the ways of the faith. And you know how many parents could honestly say that that is the first goal when they think you know when they look at how they raise their children. You know that there is often an emphasis on athletics or extracurricular activities or the academic life that has been disconnected from our understanding of who we are as human beings where theology is not a part of that education and so you know it's complete becomes completely secularized it's cut off from the deepest source of its of meaning and so I understand more and more now why parents are making that choice because how do you how do you raise a child to love God in a culture that has become so corrupt and so incapable of, of even being engaged in a di dialogue at least in traditional ways that we have in different ages that we face something radically new now and you know, I've, I've heard saints say that, you know, those who live in this age who are seeking to live out these virtues are going to, you know, suffer more than ever to live it fully. You know, think of, of the, living the life of purity or chastity in our culture. It's probably more difficult now than ever to foster that virtue in all of its fullness because we are subject to you know, the most raunchy, disgusting 
things on television and in the media. That's a probably a longer answer than you're looking for, but I think your answer is it's doable. Yeah. It seems like we approach evangelization from the like idea of wearing the world as camo and sort of like blending in and then we like sneak attack everyone we're like ha I'm a catholic and then they're like oh my gosh and you know but it seems like more and more that's based off of this idea that being a christian is being a good person that people will like and be attracted to and find interesting or find inspiring and then all of a sudden they're like what makes you so different and you're like Jesus makes me different but that's not really like you read this and you know it's about so much more than being what people consider a good person it's something complete it's like a crazy person right. <laughs> that's well, all you know that's because then Jesus becomes as flat as mm -hmm. the page that the words are written on rather than mm -hmm. a li living being that is made manifest within our own lives we are to become Christ this is why we're given the gift of the Holy Eucharist too, that we would be transformed, put on, you move from glory to glory until that reality is made manifest within us. And so, you know, just think that somehow, you know, by our participation in the culture and embracing the label of Christian is going to move people, again, is sort of foolhardy. Any, you know, any more than the scribes and the Pharisees can say, you know, we have Abraham as our father. You know, that, that, that somehow made them righteous. And, you know, so why do, why do we think that we can say, you know, we have Christ as our master and our savior, and that that alone is going to make us righteous or trans, transform our lives or transform the lives of others. Okay. <laughs> you just get used to thinking that you're in control, I think, and, and therefore we can wear it like camo or come and go in it, and, right. and you can't without really being yeah. changed by but, it. But somehow, somehow we have this uh, force field <laughs> that protects us, you know, from it. I think that really is the temptation. It's just like... Well, I can have parts of it. There's parts of it that aren't so bad. You know, there are parts of it that are fine. But, and it's kind of, it's, it's the moving from that that seems to be the hardest. It's one thing to say, like, no, I'm not just going to randomly watch R-rated movies on my Netflix account. It's another to say I'm not going to have a Netflix account because is that actually a use of my time that makes any sense? Things so, I could die tomorrow. Somehow we could redeem it, but, you know, by our participation in it, and again, you know, that's a dangerous kind of game to, to play. Yeah. yeah it's it's big rolling the dice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Putting ourselves to the test or putting God to the test. Okay. Can we move on a little bit? Uh, I believe we're on that little section there on the soul, the passions. Is that right? It is evident. <clears throat> it is evident. It is evident at the top of the second full, first full paragraph of 129. Oh, boy, okay. <laughs> it is evident, therefore, that the so-called passions of the soul are not the souls by nature. If this be so, then the soul is moved by the body's blameworthy passions, even as she is by hunger and thirst. But since no law has been imposed on her in regard to the latter, the soul is not to be blamed as she is in regard to the former passions which are subject to reproach. There are times when God permits a man to, to do something apparently improper and he receives instead of blame and censure a good rec recompense, as Hosea the prophet who married a harlot, as prophet Elias who put men to death in his zeal for God, and as those who slew their kindred by the sword at Moses' command. It is said, nevertheless, that desire and anger naturally belong to the soul apart from what pertains to the nature of the body, and that these are her passions. 
So I think we actually have to move on to the next question to grasp what he's saying here. We ask, is the soul's desire natural when it is set on fire by divine things or by the things of earth and the flesh? And is anger natural when it is said that by anger the soul's nature is excited to zeal on account of bodily desire, envy, vainglory, and the rest, or when it is on account of things opposed to these? Let the disputer reply to us on these points, and we shall follow up. Answer. Divine scripture says many things with a special intent, and often uses names figuratively, as for instance, things that pertain to the body are said of the soul, and things pertaining to the soul are said of the body, making no distinction between them. The sagacious, however, understand what they read, that is, the intent of Scripture. Likewise, things pertaining to the Lord's divinity, which are not compatible with na human nature, are said with respect to his all-holy body. And again, lowly things are said concerning his divinity, which pertain to his humanity. Many, not understanding the intent of the divine words, have stumbled here with a stumbling from which there is no recovery. So, too, it is with the names pertaining to the body and the soul. So, again, he's warning us that there is such a union between body and soul that often we will uh, sp speak of them in similar terms and fail to make the distinction. I think we do that with a lot of different things. Now, only with body and soul, but we have the tendency to do that. And he's telling us, well, part of this exercise is putting before us a dubium, if you will. You know, it, are the passions a part of the soul? Because that would make, it would make a huge difference in terms of how we understand ourselves as, as human beings and what the source of those passions are and how we engage them. And if God created us with passions, in the way that they are described here, there would also be something very difficult that we would have to work out that would create some problem for us in our anthropology, our understanding of who we are as human beings. So it's not just an empty kind of intellectual exercise here. I think what he's touching upon is, is very important. And the first important point is that often we use language in inconsistent ways. And when we delve more deeply, as we are here, we have to become more specific. Because sometimes we will attribute, attribute certain things like anger uh, to, to God as if it's inspired within us. And so we, so we have to be careful, especially when those passions seem more uh, incorporeal to us and so make us question someone was doing a little earlier. <laughs> no, just okay. So let's move on. If therefore virtue is the natural health of the soul, then the passions are an illness of the soul, which befalls and invades her nature and despoils her proper health. Now it is obvious that in every nature health is antecedent to any disease which might befall it. And if this be so, as it indeed is, then by necessity virtue is in the soul naturally. But that which is an accident is external to her nature. For it is impossible that something which is prior should be not be natural. So our natural state is one of virtue. We've been created for God, we're made in his image and likeness, and that which is accidental you know, that which ruins our health, makes us sick, is our passions. And this is the point that we have to grasp. And so it tells us then, you know, what our basic struggle to do in the spiritual life is to seek healing by the grace of God, to heal that which has become sick because of our sin that then gives rise to our passions. Okay. Did you follow? Yes. I, this seems very similar to, if I get my church father correct, Gregory of Nyssa's concept 
that a human being is like a pearl that has been caked over by layers and layers of sand and dirt and grime, and that just living your life in Christ is an exercise in taking those layers off so that you can discover the pearl of great price underneath. Right. Uh, very mm -hmm. similar type of uh, right. idea. And would be, I think, very challenging to the modern mind, you know, to think we've been created for virtue. And insofar as we're pursuing everything that is contrary to that, we're very sick. I mean, the illness that we suffer with is, is grave. And that the cure for that illness, you know, is going to require specific means. The cleansing of that pearl that has become encased in sand and dirt. And that's not necessarily going to be an easy thing for us. Okay. So question. Do the bodily passions belong to the soul by nature or by accident? And are the passions of the soul, which she possesses by reason of her connection with the body, said to be hers by nature or as a figure of speech. No one dares to say that the passions belong to the body only figuratively, but as for the soul, one must be bold and say inasmuch as it is recognized and confessed by all that purity is a natural property of the soul, that the passions in no wise belong to the soul by nature, for sickness is posterior, posterior to health, and it is impossible that one and the same nature be both good and evil. Therefore, of necessity, one must precede the other, and the one which is prior is also the natural, because anything which is accidental is not said to belong to a nature, but to intrude from without. And change follows upon every accident and intrusion, Nature, however, does not change or alter itself. So, you know, our, the nature of our soul is virtuous and pure. And if we are to follow logically, what he's saying here is that you know, corruption only comes after. You know, we weren't created corrupt. That the corruption comes in and through our sin. So to say that passions are a part of the soul is to say that God created us corrupt. He created us ill. I don't know how to put it more clearly than that. So a couple things. So one way in which it seems like he's differing quite a lot from writers we've read before are passions for him essentially um, sources of, of evil and corruption? Like, there's no such thing as a purified passion or a properly ordered passion. Mm -hmm. They're all just principles of corruption and sin, basically. Right. And then, insofar as, well... I'm a little stuck on the fact that God obviously made us in a body, and so if the passions right. are natural to the and body, they're going to be natural <clears throat> to us insofar as we're never going to cease to be soul and body. We're man, and we're always going to be. <laughs> so the body being by nature connect the, with the passions and the passions being nothing but evil would just seem to <laughs> present kind well. of a problem. I think, you know, we often say that a person is passionate and will, so, meaning that they have strong feelings about something. And we'll equate that with the passions. And I think that's a mistake in our, our thinking. So God creates us. You know, we have uh, bodily, natural bodily desires, hunger, thirst, all, all of these things. We have feelings, emotions, you know, they're all part of who we are as a human being. And come, what comes along is our sin through the fall and 
those things then become distorted and misdirected and often then directed towards others or towards ourselves. So uh, that becomes the problem for us. It's that that which is created and that which is good becomes corrupted by our sin and becomes a passion because of the sin because it's distorted. It's no longer, it's an illness. It's no longer functioning in the way that it should be. So that's like Adam and Eve. You know, the, the, the issue for them was, you know, one of identity, you know, that they didn't want to live in this obedience to God in, a, in accord with their humanity and dependence upon God. We want to be gods. And then with the fall comes the inability then to uh, guide and direct their own natural desires, passions, begin to emerge and so they have to cover their their nakedness at that point but prior to that there wouldn't have been any distorted aspect to their natural human desires and needs all of those things would have been a means of communion and union with God and with one another and now they become an obstacle to that because these very things have become ill. Is he is he saying on on a more on a basic level though that um, passions are not natural to us, us meaning man generally, because in the beginning Adam and Eve were without passion. <laughs> then then sin came along. Now we all find ourselves, uh, in a certain sense, it's natural that we all have passions, bec only because of the fall. But it's not natural to us as man right. to have passions. Right. Is that right? And no, well, I we guess all live with it what now I'm kind of thinking of, of more is he's being a lot more precise than we found earlier, where it's like. Like we've to we spoke so much in Cassian about like not cutting off the passions because then they would cripple the human being. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like there was kind of a blending of that emotional um, thinking, feeling person and the passion where it's like don't cut off the passion of desire because in trying to cut off lust, you cut off your ability to desire. Mm -hmm. he, it seems like he's being more precise <laughs> and saying, we cut out lust completely. Well, I think we this is why, not to interrupt, but I think this is why he's saying, you know, there's going to be people who dispute me on this, because this was a dispute, even among the fathers, you know, whether the passions were part of who we created, you know, were part of who we are as created beings or not. And I think there is this issue of, uh, again, tying desire and passions too closely together. Because if you say the passions are rooted and have their origin in desire, then they are something with which we are created. And so just then need to be transformed by the grace of God, re-educated, reformed, Whereas if you just allow desire to be what it is, the sense of incompleteness outside of God, you know, that leads us towards him, we've been created for him, and so that we have these natural desires, and the, the, even our lower desires become reflective of that. You know, our natural hunger is reflective of our hunger for God and his love. Uh, so if we allow desire simply to be desire, and make that distinct from passions, then I think we fall along the path of Isaac, which is different from what some other fathers have done. But I think he's being, he is being very precise, you're right. I mean, he, he says, you know, health is what we are created with, and health is virtue and purity. And you can't place the illness before that, 
you know, what we were created with is purity, you know, and virtue. And something happened to corrupt that. And because we know this, then we have to say passions aren't from God. They arise out of our, our sin, which has corrupted our desire and corrupted our natural appetites. I think it's that separation of desire and passion that's really kind of unique to him that explains that a lot better. Yeah, because I, I, think, I think a lot of the fathers thought then if you cut off that desire, then if desire is an essential aspect <laughs> of loving, mm -hmm. then uh, if you cut that off, then you make yourself something less than human. And I think Isaac just isn't going to go there. I think the clarity of his thought on this is no. Desire seems more like a more active thing, like something that I, I want to do. Passion seems more like an involuntary thing that it's always there and I can give into it. Is that, or am I not understanding? Right. Or an illness then that makes us act in ways or inhibits us in certain ways. You know, whereas desire in and of itself could have a very clear goal, you know, which is to love and to give ourselves some love. So when we, oh, I'm sorry, mm. but when we sin, is this, is the soul is still pure, but it's trapped inside this sinful person, or is it dragged along into the sin? Well, we wouldn't say trapped, because we're, what we're saying that there's a ra radical communion there between the two. But what We're that saying that the soul, though, can be impacted negatively by the passions. It is made ill, even though its natural state is not that of illness, it's a virtue. But because of that radical union between body and soul, then it can become ill, it can be affected by that. And so where we begin is with the ascetical life and, you know, reining in our appetites, you know, struggling with those things, fasting, controlling our sleep, all those things. This is where we gain some freedom. Father, one, uh, Father had his hand up first. <laughs> I just noticed that sometimes what's helpful for me is to remember that also other church fathers in an attempt to grapple with this difficult issue. Mm -hmm. um, tonight you have virtue, um, purity, health, you know, one side. Mm -hmm. Then you have the opposite of virtue as the passion, mm -hmm. that which is worldly, that which is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. but some church fathers, in an attempt to grapple with this, also introduced the concept of um, what was the condition of our soul and body before the fall and after the fall. Mm -hmm. And they used the metaphor of light and heavy. Mm -hmm. So they would say the soul which is pure, which is healthy, mm -hmm. was soulish, it was, it was light, whereas after sin it becomes fleshly. Mm -hmm. The body before yeah. sin was soulish, but now the body is heavy. Mm -hmm. And, and that, yeah. I think that nuance also helps to carry through this, this idea or this concept of um, the, the, the virtues, because they were more natural, it, it kind of, it really made your, your life easier, <laughs> as in weighed down, right. which is what sin does. It kind of right. makes it difficult to do anything. Right. Uh, yep. and, and this whole caught me on, because when, when you think of what was it that Christ was doing, that he could now, at the resurrection, walk through through, you know, a wall, or his body, which was real, and yet nevertheless it didn't have the limitations that we now have, so that some of the church fathers simply said, well, this was a soulish body, which is the way it was before the fall into sin, right. now we have a heavy body that doesn't <laughs> function the right. way God made it, right. so it's not necessarily saying that the body, because it has fallen prey to the passions, or the soul, mm -hmm. because it's fallen prey to the passions, that they are somehow evil. Mm -hmm. It's simply saying that they're defective. Mm -hmm. And our task 
is to go back to the healthy state, not necessarily calling it um, depraved or evil or useless for all of eternity, but right. simply saying, restore the health and things will be back where they were. Right. Yeah. I think that's good. I think whatever side you sort of come down on, I think the good thing about it is this image of, of health versus illness that this is what the Eastern Fathers seem to put forward with a kind of consistency that, you know, that's what we are seeking in and through the spiritual spiritual life. But, so to, somebody else had a, you had your hand up? Oh, well, just a quick, I, when you had mentioned uh, the soul being trapped in mm -hmm. sin, it just seemed that, I don't know if you were picking up on his image of the pearl being covered but it seemed to be that's where that image kind of falls short, not to take away from Gregory the witness of it, it's kind of the opposite of Luther, saying that fundamentally our nature is corrupt, but Christ just covers over it with, you know, with, makes it look nice. Whereas in this image, it's as though we're just, we're really pure inside, it's just we're being a bit mm -hmm. covered over, done. which somewhat negates the interior transformation mm -hmm and the interior healing that right. needs to happen in the soul. There's a, this like little soul with a face that's like, help yeah. me, I'm stuck in here. <laughs> in some ways it's, it's more positive because what it's saying is if you apply yourself to the ascetic life, mm -hmm. if you allow yourself to be a vessel of the Holy Spirit, then that pearl is still <clears throat> there. No, it's, I don't want to take <coughs> away at all from no, no, I, image. I understand what you're saying, but it, but it just seems, I, I think what, what Gregory was trying to say is that it's worth the effort, it's worth the investment, because there's still something there that is valuable in God's sight and can be salvaged. Yeah. It's, it's like and it's fundamentally not all lost. precious. You're not all, you know, completely... I think we should solve this question by trial by combat. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> no. Okay, we're, we're at 8.30, so we're going to oh. stop here for the evening. That was a, a lot to cover, and we still have quite a bit yet uh, in this chapter or in this homily where he will then move on to discuss purity of mind, purity of heart. And so I think maybe as he applies it a little bit for us, too, maybe we'll gain some greater clarity in the weeks to come. Okay. For next week, we'll be over at the National Institute for Newman Studies because of the study session here. So just remember, we'll be across the street uh, on Dithridge here. Okay. And when we close, as always, with prayer. in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. 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 Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Okay, thank you. Thank you.